Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass on Liver Transplantation. Liver transplantation is the treatment of choice for appropriately selected patients with end-stage liver disease. Let's take a case-based approach. Mr. Jones presents with abdominal tenderness. Let's go through the clinical signs that we would expect on examination in a patient who's had a liver transplant. On inspection, you would expect a well-healed Mercedes-Benz scar. You may see associated horizontal scars, which could be from post-operative drains, and you should comment on those. Comment on whether the scar is recent or old, and whether it appears healthy. On palpation, if the transplant is a success, you would not expect abdominal tenderness on superficial or deep palpation. There should be no obvious signs of hepato or splenomegaly, and no obvious additional masses. Percussion, you would not expect the development of ascites from a functioning transplanted liver, and so you would not expect any evidence of shifting dullness on percussion. Auscultation should be normal bowel sounds with no obvious hepatic, renal or aortic bruise. A patient who's had a transplant will now be on lifelong immunosuppression, so it's important for you to comment on the key features of the manifestations of those drugs. Let's take steroids. Steroids such as long-term prednisolone, would result in a Cushingoid appearance. So the patient may appear obese or have a, a, a buffalo hump or a moon-shaped face and may have striae on the abdomen from rapid distension as well as thin skin, bruising and purpura. Another drug given is cyclosporin. That may result in hypertension, but clinically you may see signs of gum hypertrophy or hirsutism. Liver transplantation may be as a result of an acute drug overdose, such as paracetamol, but could be given as a result of chronic liver disease. If the patient had chronic liver disease, you would expect a number of other clinical signs to be present. So in the hands, you may see palmar erythema, dupitans contracture, bruising, as or, or previously asterixis, which you hope would have abated with a liver transplant. If the patient had an acute uh, intoxication due to paracetamol overdose, these signs may not manifest and the patient may just have developed encephalopathy and asterixis and rapidly develop liver failure. So presenting the case, you may say Mr. Jones is a Caucasian man presenting for a clinical review. The patient was comfortable at rest and I believe the gentleman has signs consistent with a liver transplant. On examination, the abdomen had a well-heeled Mercedes-Benz scar. I also noted a smaller 2 cm horizontal scar in the right hypochondrium, which was likely used for post-operative drains. The scar looks recently healed and is healthy, and there's no abdominal tenderness on superficial or deep palpation, and no organomegaly. There was no evidence of shifting dullness to evidence ascites. On auscultation, bowel sounds were present and normal, and there was no obvious hepatic, renal or aortic bruit. The patient had signs of previous chronic liver disease, including clubbing, palmar erythema, dupitans contracture and leukonychia. The pulse was regular and the patient appeared otherwise well. There were no obvious needle track marks and I noted no evidence of jaundice or scleral icterus and there were some spider nevi and bilateral gynecomastia. There was no evidence of peripheral edema and the patient did not appear Cushingoid if it was a recent transplant or a Cushingoid if the transplant was old. However, there was a fine tremor and some gum hypertrophy related to possible cyclosporin use. In the context of chronic liver disease, it's important to have a scoring system to help prognosticate patients. The Charles Pugh classification is an excellent way to do this. The score uses the levels of albumin, the bilirubin, the clotting, as well as the severity of ascites and the presence of encephalopathy to score patients. A score of between five to six point classifies the patient as Charles Pugh A, and the one year survival for these patients is predicted at 100% and two year survival at 87%. Through to class C, where patients score a score of 10 to 15, classifying them as Charles Pugh C. In this classification, the prognosis is poor, where the expected survival for one year is 45%, and the expected survival at two years is only 35%. Another criteria to be aware of is the King's College criteria for liver transplantation. And there are two important subsets. There's the paracetamol-related liver failure and the non-paracetamol-related failure. King's College criteria advocates that in the presence of 
paracetamol overdose if the arterial pH is less than 7.3, 24 hours after ingestion, the patient should be referred for transplantation. Or if they have the following three criteria, the presence of a prothrombin time of more than 100 seconds or an INR of more than 6.5, a creatinine of more than 300 micromoles per litre, or whether they have grade three or four encephalopathy. In this scoring system, lactate and phosphate are measured purely for the purposes of prognostication. In the absence of paracetamol-related liver failure, a PT of more than 100 seconds or an INR of more than 6.5 is an indication for referral for liver failure. Or if three of the following five criteria are present, other drug-induced liver failure, an age of less than 10 or more than 40, or whether it's more than a week from the first jaundice to encephalopathy, or whether the PT is more than 50 seconds, or the bilirubin is more than 300 micromoles per litre, the patient should be referred for transplantation. Now, of course, the decision for transplantation is a complicated multidisciplinary team one with a patient-centered approach. The patient must be motivated to be abstinent from alcohol as well as recreational drug usage and have absence of significant comorbidities. Moreover, an objective score, a UKL score, of more than 49 needs to be present in order for the patient to be added to the list. The UKL score, which stands for the United Kingdom End Stage Liver Disease Score, is a medical scoring system which helps prognosticate patients with chronic liver disease. A score of 49 indicates that a 9% one-year risk of mortality, and that's the minimum score required to be added to the liver transplant waiting list in the UK. Investigating patients with liver disease requires an extensive range of investigations. Bloods, a full blood count to exclude infection or GI bleeding, low platelets may suggest splenic sequestration, use and ease, of course LFTs including the AST, the ALP, the Gamma GT, ALT, as well as bilirubin and albumin will give an overall idea of how well the liver is functioning including from a synthetic point of view. The CRP would help uh, determine whether or not an infection is on board. Viral serology, including for hepatitis, CMV, EBV, should be sent, as well as paracetamol levels, alpha-1 antitrypsin levels, and various other features of the liver screen. The clotting to determine the PT and the INR is important, as well as cultures if you're suspecting an infection. A blood gas, including an arterial blood gas, is useful to help calculate the pH, lactate, and bicarbonate. But investigations should be tailored around the etiology. The, the liver screen, helps determine the cause of liver failure. So when a viral screen is sent, that would allow you to determine which virus is affecting the liver. If you're suspecting hemochromatosis, then iron studies are important. In hemochromatosis, where you have elevated levels of iron, elevated levels of ferritin, and, and therefore the uh, reduction in the total iron binding capacity or a raised transferrin saturation would be suggestive of hemochromatosis. If you're thinking about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, the, uh, the, of course the serum levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin would be reduced, but the patient should be sent for electrophoresis looking for PIZZ and PISZ patterns. If you're thinking about Wilson's disease, serum copper levels should be sent and they would be expected to be reduced, as would serum chiroplasmin levels be reduced and ur urinary copper excretion would be increased. PBC or primary biliary cirrhosis is associated with raised anti-mitochondrial antibodies and raised IgM, usually ANA and ANCA positive, whereas PSE is more strongly associated with ANA and ANCA positive antibodies. Autoimmune hepatitis is associated with anti-smooth muscle antibodies or anti-liver kidney muscle 1 antibodies as well as anti-soluble liver antigen and anti-soluble liver and pancreas antigens. If you're suspecting alcoholic liver disease, you may see a macrocytic picture along with a thrombocytopenic picture with elevated IgA levels. Hepatocellular cancer as a result of liver disease, you would expect raised alpha feta protein, and in Gilbert's disease, you would have elevated conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin levels, which would increase in a fasted state. Other investigations, if the patient has ascites, the acidic fluid should be sent for analysis. Its colour should be assessed. Clear straw coloured is associated with transudates and exudates. Turbidity may be as a result of bacterial peritonitis. Yellow would be a chylus acidic collection. And a hemorrhagic 
uh, appearance of the fluid may be as a result of trauma or malignancy. The clinical chemistry would allow you to determine whether the ascites is as a result of a transudative or exudative process, depending on whether the protein content is less than 25 grams per litre for a transudate or more for an exudate. An acidic fluid would be sent for microscopy, culture and sensitivities. <clears throat> In the presence of ascites, the serum ascites albumin gradient or SARG gradient is calculated. This is done by a simple equation, the acidic albumin minus the serum albumin. And if this is 11 or more, that would suggest that the patient has portal hypertension and a gradient of less than 11 suggests that the patient is unlikely to have portal hypertension. Additionally, you may want to send the urine and the faeces for analysis. They would require imaging, particularly liver imaging, which could take form in the shape of an ultrasound or a duplex ultrasound looking for the presence of organomegaly or focal hepatic lesions, a CT scan to look in more detail, and if you're trying to, uh, to identify lesions specifically, an MRCP, an MRI of the liver would be helpful. If there's evidence of portal hypertension, OGD colonoscopy would help determine whether or not the patient is at risk of variceal bleeding. The management of liver disease is complicated and requires a multidisciplinary team approach with a patient-centered uh, approach. You should follow the liver bundle pathway, looking at the conservative medical and surgical measures aimed at supporting the patient. Conservatively, these patients should have good nutrition and alcohol abstinence. Any comorbidity should be optimized. If they are becoming drowsy, then the airway needs to be protected. Cannulate, catheter these patients, monitor their uh, urine input and output closely, monitor their BMs as patients with liver disease and liver failure can be at risk of hypoglycemia, which may obscure the picture of uh, encephalopathy. If the patient's at risk of aspirating, consider NG tube feeding and monitor baseline investigations and involve specialists early on and the multidisciplinary team. If the patient develops ascites, they may require diuretics, with spironolactone if their potassium is stable, and frusimide. If the ascites are large, they will require a paracentesis, and with large volume paracentesis, an albumin cover is required, and careful and slow fluid removal uh, should be done. Oral midodrine has also been shown to improve the clinical outcomes in patients with refractory ascites. If despite medication and dietary interventions, the patient has ongoing ascites, they may require a TIPS procedure or a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic stent shunt. And if all else fails, then the patient should be considered for liver transplantation. It's important to manage liver disease aggressively, as if the condition presents, the patient may develop hepatorenal syndrome, so failure of the liver and the kidneys. And this occurs in patients who are rapidly develop liver failure and renal failure, and that can be detected by a raise in the urea and the creatinine, which does not respond to conventional fluid therapy. In hepatorenal syndrome, type 1 and type 2, type 1 is rapidly progressive and median survival is very, very limited. Two weeks in uh, extreme cases. And type 2 hepatorenal syndrome is a more steady deterioration in the renal function and medial survival is six months. The complications uh, of liver disease if the patients do develop hepatorenal syndrome would require prompt treatment. They would require escalation to high dependency unit and possibly intensive care unit. They would require albumin cover as well as terlipressin, which is a vasoconstrictor and so has limited use in patients with peripheral arteriopathy or coronary artery disease. They may require hemodialysis, a TIPS procedure or liver transplantation. Apart from the complications, liver disease intrinsically can give rise to bleeding. If the patient becomes coagulopathic due to the reduced production of clotting factors 2, 7, 9 and 10, vitamin K may be required, along with other blood products such as FFP platelets and a blood, a blood transfusion. If the patient develops infection or, system, or spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, they would require broad, broad spectrum antibiotics and they would require very close monitoring. 
pruritus can be treated by, by cholestyramine. And if the patient develops encephalopathy, and there are various grades, grade one encephalopathy, encephalopathies where there's just altered mood behavior and sleep pattern. Grade two is where the patient becomes drowsy, confused, and may have slurred speech. Where three is where the patient becomes incoherent, develops stupor, restlessness, or significant confusion. Or four, where the patient becomes comatose, occurs due to the high levels of nitrogenous waste that builds up the ammonia that builds up, passes through to the blood-brain barrier in the, in the uh, central nervous system, the astrocytes try to clear the excess waste, they try to clear the nitrogen, converting glutamate to glutamine, but this excess glutamine causes an osmotic imbalance, causing a shift of fluid into the neural cells, leading to cerebral edema. So in order to reduce the nitrogenous waste, patients are given lactulose to try and uh, increase uh, waste, through, waste excretion through the feces. They may require rifaximin, neomycin. These are antibiotics which can also help excrete waste products. Sedatives should be avoid, avoided so that the diagnosis is not obscured. If the patient does develop cerebral edema, they would require transfer to level two or three care, and they may require IV mannitol or hyperventilation to reduce the ceilings of, uh, to reduce the cerebral edema. It's a complicated condition and ceilings of care need to be set. Early discussions with hepatologists, intensivists take place to determine which patients would benefit from aggressive management on intensive care and high dependency care. Uh, and as a result of this, discussions with the patient uh, should take place early while they're compass mentors to discuss their resuscitation. In this masterclass, we discussed liver transplantation, the clinical presentation, as well as the backdrop to chronic liver disease, its management, the various prognostication criteria used, as well as the King's College criteria, and how we would proceed to manage patients with liver disease, as well as the complications and the importance of setting ceilings. Thank you very much for attending this medical masterclass.